good morning everybody or good evening depending on wherever you are and uh, welcome to the lecture today and i would like to welcome uh, dr ram sharan rangarajan he is an assistant professor in the department of mechanical engineering at iisc bangalore his group works on nonlinear solid mechanics and uh, uh, using a combination of mechanical modeling numerical simulations and desktop experiments uh, I, i'm very excited to hear about uh, what uh, ram has to say and i'm i'm pretty certain all of you are uh, uh, without taking much time ram the stage is yours thank you very much for accepting the invitation i'm looking forward to your lecture thank you ajay thank you everyone for uh, joining this session i know it's a saturday afternoon the test match is coming up very soon so i really appreciate you being here so hopefully you will find this uh, discussion interesting it's a small group right and that's fine man so uh, please feel free to ask questions anytime it's not going to be an interruption this is supposed to be a this is supposed to be a discussion so i think ajay has given us the license to do whatever we want so feel free to uh, speak up anytime you want uh, so i just want to acknowledge three students whose work uh, you will see uh, in the discussion that i'm going to start so one is arun other is purnakant and the third student is darshan okay so i said that uh, my talk is going to be about uh, nonlinear structural mechanics right uh, so i have to say what i mean by that so so that we are all on the same page right i'll start by clarifying that i'm going to talk exclusively about what is called geometric nonlinearity now what does this mean so let's say that we have some loaded structure say a plate and to model how this plate will respond to some loading we would formulate a force balance right so we start with a displacement field we will relate it to some strain measures so these strain measures will measure uh, how lengths change how angles change how volumes change areas change and so on and so because of this strain the material will feel some pain so it will respond with some stress right so uh, these stresses have to be distributed in such a way that uh, the whole body is at equilibrium right that's our typical differential equation that we will solve so throughout this talk i am going to assume that the relation between strain and stress is linear okay that's what is called material linearity and this is generally okay as long as the loads remain small right so if the loads are larger then the material can respond in some other way right so maybe it will stiffen maybe it will soften because of yielding maybe it will fracture can't really say so uh, uh, just keep in mind that the relation between strain and stress is going to be uh, linear uh, irrespective of what the material is made of but uh, the relationship between displacements and strains is going to be nonlinear that's what i mean by uh, geometric nonlinearity okay so it may seem a little strange that i'm saying the strains are going to be small but uh, they are going to be computed in some nonlinear way uh, using the displacement why do you need a nonlinear relationship to compute something that is small Right, so i'll give you an example so on the right you see a plate which is just rotated by 45 degrees okay uh, so because of this rotation uh, you can relate the uh, reference and the deformed coordinates in some way just a rotation matrix here and because of this rotation we don't expect any strain all i did was i took this plate and turned it around by 45 degrees now if you compute the small strain measure the symmetric gradient of the displacement that we usually do in um, in linear elasticity right you will find that there is about 30% strain along the coordinate directions right which is of course absurd because you don't expect any strain in the body so on the other hand if you use uh, what's called the green lagrange strain which is some nonlinear strain measure you get back the fact that there is in fact no strain in the plate so the take away message is that just because the strain is small doesn't mean that it has to be related linearly with the displacements there is a reason why uh, the strain has to be computed in non linear way starting from the displacements okay so the second aspect is that this is going to be a talk about or a discussion about uh, structural mechanics so what this means is one of at least one of the dimensions is going to be small so for a plate this may mean that the thickness is going to be small so what's the significance of this so this means that instead of uh, worrying about uh, stress distributions across this thickness because the thickness is so small it doesn't make sense to account for variations of quantities across 1 mm 1 micron and so on 
So we are only going to talk about uh, forces and moment balances rather than stress balances, right? So uh, we will care about some averages of uh, stresses, some averages of uh, uh, stresses across cross sections. And so even our constitutive relationships will be in terms of, um, let's say stretches and forces, changes in curvature and moments rather than between strains and stresses themselves. Okay, so this is the uh, background that I have in mind. And uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, I'll walk you through a couple of problems. I'm pretty clear that I want to stop in under an hour for sure, preferably at 45 minutes. At the 45 minute mark, we'll take a call on whether to stop wherever I am. Because I think our attention span uh, <laughs> takes a dip around the 40 minute mark and it, it doesn't serve much of a purpose trying to uh, just uh, have, a, have an extended session. So the first problem that I'm going to talk about is, um, is a 1D problem. It's about how we can use a flexible element, just a beam in this case, as a robot. So when I call a beam a robot, it means that it has to do something useful and in a controllable way. Uh, so I've aimed this talk at, uh, let's say, a graduate student who is taking an elective on structural mechanics. I think that is fairly representative of the few people in the audience. So uh, the problem is one dimensional, right? How hard can it be? And I want some the students who are here to uh, have something that they can take away. And I'm sure there are a few experts in the audience also. I hope you don't mind this part. Uh, it's not that I'm going to say something wrong. It's just that I, you will already be familiar with some of the material here. Uh, the second problem is about uh, what are called ribbon structures. I've labeled this as 1.5D, not because of some fractal dimension. Okay, just in a very informal sense, you'll see that uh, we will think of ribbons as uh, structures which are uh, wider than rods, but narrower than plates, right? So the average of 1D and 2D is 1.5D. Okay, so I'll discuss this part in much less detail, maybe in about around 10 to 15 minutes at most, mainly because we'll be short on time and, uh, and attention. So my agenda here is just to highlight some interesting aspects of, uh, of elastic ribbons, okay? Uh, so I'll uh, get started with the first problem. Ajay, can you just let me know that uh, things are visible okay on the screen? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the first problem is essentially about this picture. Uh, the, can I just uh, interrupt once uh, and ask a question? Sorry? Uh, can I just interrupt once and ask a question? Of course. Yeah. So, but you have to tell me your name. Because yeah, I can't see. Uh, I'm Shreya, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so I am, uh, at first I am begging your pardon that if I ask something very stupid because I don't really work in the area. Uh, you like just, it. you just tell Ajay to edit out your question from the, from the video he will upload later on, right? Don't worry, just ask <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> no, that is cool. I really work on the intersection of robotics and electrical engineering. So okay. I, I am uh, asking something that is, uh, are we going to uh, learn about uh, the inverse modeling of differential equations over here related to structural mechanics? Uh, in some sense, yes. Yeah, in some sense, yeah. Okay, that's it. Okay, very good. So, uh, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. You'll see that there is some connection. Okay, so the first problem more or less is about this picture that you see on screen here. And the question is, um, how well can you manipulate the claw by tugging on these little strips of paper, right? And the significance is that if you can figure out this question, we can then start to use flexible elements in, in robotics applications, okay? So the appeal for flexible robotics is very clear in the area of medicine, because uh, this is an area where you want to make small miniaturized, highly manipulatable devices. Here you see a video of a steerable device, an animation of a steerable device that can be used to remove kidney stones, for example. And there is lots of inspiration from nature also, right? Uh, octopus tentacles and elephant trunks, these have inspired people to make, uh, to design robots in very novel ways. They've inspired new kinds of actuation mechanisms. And if you come up with some principles which are invariant, which are uh, insensitive to scale, then you could even think of making these, deploying these kinds of robots in space. For example, the Canada arm on the International Space Station is about 17 meters in length, right? So we want to see whether we can come up with principles which will work at the millimeter scale 
but also at the uh, very uh, tens of meter scale, right? And uh, so one approach to, uh, well, the other thing I'll say is the, the little video that you're going to see on screen here. So uh, one thing I'll say is that the design of flexible robots and things like these uh, is a very challenging task, but still in some sense is ahead of methods to control uh, flexible robots. So the video you see on the bottom right of your screen uh, is called the Octa. It's from about 2013 or 14. And it, is still, it was still a major advancement in the field, right? So it's clear that the distinction between what could be, which is the animation on the left, and what reality is, which is uh, the demonstration on the right, is still quite stark, right? So that's why I think that there is a lot of scope for, for research in this area. So one approach to designing uh, how methods to control flexible robots is to bring them back into uh, how we typically think of typical robots, right? So you bring, make some approximations so that you can think of a flexible element as a large collection of rigid links and actuators. Then you can use the toolboxes that you already have, right? A second approach is to adopt the increasingly more popular is to make use of statistical methods. So you try to train uh, a black box by giving it a large sample set of inputs and outputs. And uh, this black box essentially learns about the physics of the system in some, in some way, and it will start to correlate inputs and outputs. So my point here is that both of these approaches uh, kind of ignore the fact that mechanics can predict how these structures behave, right? That's what we want to be able to exploit. Okay, so what is it that we want to do? Okay, uh, so this video uh, kind of summarizes what we want to do. Uh, you, what you see here on screen is, is a flexible arm. It's just a plastic scale. And uh, what is driving the arm is a pair of cables. Okay, one cable is attached to the tip. The other cable is attached somewhere in the middle. Okay, and uh, uh, the exact attachment points are not important. Uh, I mean, are important, but it's not, doesn't change the functioning principle. So these cables control the arm and the arm traces some shapes in some reasonably accurate way. Okay, there are a couple of motors you see at the bottom of your screen, and these are reeling, reeling the cables in and out in some controllable manner. And as a result, the position of the tip of the arm uh, can be manipulated. So the reason I think this could be a good problem is because if you can transform what's possibly the simplest structural element, right, a beam, into something that you can manipulate, then, you know, the possibilities open up. So more broadly, uh, the idea is that um, if this is an example of, uh, this is an example application where you can use geometric nonlinearity for some benefit, right? So people are increasingly trying to use uh, phenomena like buckling and instabilities uh, in uh, new engineering applications. So this could fit well within that framework. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll walk you through how this robot actually works. Okay, and again, like I said, uh, please speak up if you have questions because this is intended for uh, for students who want to be able to, uh, I mean, uh, who have an interest in structural mechanics and all the equations are within, within your reach. Okay, so uh, let's start by idealizing the setup. What you see on the left is the setup from the video and what you see on the right is its idealization. So we are going to think of the arm as a, a planar beam, right? That's the structure in red. And then we are going to replace these cables by inextensible structures here in blue, okay? So these cables are inextensible and they can only support tension because if you put in any compression, the cable will slacken. And these cables are routed through uh, posts here that I will call routing posts. So these are the points R1 and R2. They're not essential, it's just to keep the motors away from the setup, okay? So um, we then apply some, let's imagine that we then apply some tension in the cables. Uh, these tensions are labeled as P1 and P2, right? So these are the tensions in the cables. I've pulled them with my hand or with the motors. And because of these tensions, the arm will bend, okay? Now notice that the cable attached at the far end remains attached at the far end. The one attached in the middle remains attached to the middle, right? So these cables cannot slide. You know, the attachment point cannot slide along the beam. Similarly, the routing points don't change during the course of deformation. Okay, our goal then is to figure out how do I pull on these cables so that the tip goes to a position that I want. 
So that's the, the simple problem. And uh, so the way that this tracing video works is that I give a sequence of uh, target positions for the tip, and then I find out what are the corresponding sequence of tension that I need to pull on these cables with, so that I can make the tip go to the target position. Okay, so uh, to do to be able to do this, we have to make some choices, right? How are we going to model the arm? How are we going to model the beam? How are we going to model the cable loads, right? And thirdly, it looks like we have an inverse problem here because uh, what we want to do is not compute the deflection when you're given the tensions, but you're saying that given the deflections, how do we compute the, the tensions that we need to impose? Okay, the other thing to notice is that, okay, the, these are necessarily large deflections, right? The strains are still small, but the deflections um, are still quite large. So the typical strength of materials theories we learn in class, in the strength of materials class may not exactly be applicable here. So we have to put in some thought there. With the cable loads, the main complication comes from the fact that as the, the only thing you control are the tensions in the cables, the directions in which the cable load acts depends on the solution, depends on how the beam actually bends, right? So in that sense, the loading here is what is called the configuration dependent loading. You can control the tension, but you can't really control the direction in which you apply the tension, okay? And the third problem is that we have an inverse problem. So we have to, as uh, one of you just mentioned, looks like uh, we have to find some uh, parameters in a differential equation. That's what uh, it will come down to. Okay, uh, uh, are there any questions so far? Shall I proceed? A yes, no will do from anyone. Doesn't seem like no. there are any questions. No, sir, no questions. No questions. Okay. Okay, thanks. So the beam model that we are going to use is what's called the elastic arm. Okay, this is a very classical model and it's almost a prototypical theory in, in nonlinear mechanics. And this is my one slide uh, version of it. Uh, so here, is, essentially what you have is uh, imagine that uh, you have a beam which is clamped at one end, then you apply a load at the other end. That's the load P. I have resolved this. One more. I've resolved this into a horizontal component PH and a vertical component PV, right? And we want to be able to predict how this uh, beam will bend, okay? And so uh, the assumptions that are made in this model are very similar to what we learn in strength of materials in the technical theory, right? The center line is inextensible, the cross sections remain plain and normal and so on, right? The main difference is that this theory now allows for uh, uh, deflections to be large and rotations to be large as well, okay? So that's the main distinction, okay, that uh, displacements and rotations can be large. And uh, like, the, like the technical theory, we'll still assume that the relation between moments and uh, curvatures is going to be linear. So this is, um, again, valid as long as the loading P is not too large, okay? So uh, a simple way to incorporate the inextensibility constraint is you don't try to compute the coordinates of the of the deflected beam directly. You don't try to compute x and y. Instead, you compute the inclination of the tangent to the horizontal. So as you walk along the beam, starting from the left to the right, the tangent will gradually rotate, right? So you keep track of what's the angle theta as a function of s. If you think of this as our primary unknown, then the inextensibility assumption is easily incorporated. Basically, you compute theta, and then from there, you can reconstruct the profile of the beam by just integrating along the tangent, right? I hope this makes sense. And uh, equilibrium now is a statement about moment balance, right? So uh, imagine that, uh, so every point, at every point along the beam, moments have to be balanced, or you can take arbitrary sections of the beam and moments have to be balanced, right? So imagine making a virtual cut along this blue line on the left of your screen, okay? We are going to write down moment balance for the section running from the blue line all the way up to the tip, okay? Because you've made the cut, there is going to be an internal moment because uh, the left end, which was cut away, will react, right? So that's the term on the left here. This is the bending modulus times the, cur times the curvature. 
So the reaction moment because of the cup is the bending modulus times the curvature. So this is the internal moment. Because you have the loads at the far end, you will have the arm times the load. That's the external moment, right? So you can think of the right hand side as the horizontal arm PH times as the horizontal force PH times the vertical arm plus the vertical load PV times the horizontal arm. That's what you see on the right hand side, right? So internal moments have to be balanced with external moments. This could be the, the stopping point, but you now have a, uh, a mixture of uh, derivatives and integral signs. So we we'll differentiate this once with respect to the arc length. Uh, uh, just repeat the moment balance equation. So because you've made a, a virtual cut, right? You are looking at the free body diagram for the part starting from mm -hmm. arc length s. Mm -hmm. All the we have some crosstalk, I guess. Uh, no, no problem. So uh, we have the internal moment on the left, which is the bending modulus times the curvature. And then the external moment on the right, which is the horizontal force times the vertical arm plus the vertical force times the horizontal arm. Okay, so we can differentiate this moment balance statement once to get a statement about force balance. So if you differentiate uh, this whole equation with respect to the arc length parameter, right, you see you get EI bending modulus times d square theta by ds square. That's the rate of change of curvature. Then you get uh, the Loads are don't depend on S, but the dependence on S in the horizontal and vertical arms comes through the lower bound S that is here. So if you remember Leibniz rule, right? Differentiating this integral sign will give you minus cos theta, and differentiating this integral sign will give you minus sine theta. So that's why the uh, the signs reverse on the right hand side. Okay. So now you have a differential equation, right? A nonlinear differential equation that we can solve as soon as you have a couple of boundary conditions to apply. So in this case, you'll say that the left end is clamped and the right end is moment free. Okay, so uh, none of this, I mean, all of this is classical stuff, right? None of this is stuff that you know, I thought of. <laughs> so the bending of a beam, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the equation that you see here uh, is actually closely related to the equation for oscillations of a pendulum. Let me explain how. So if you mark the angle alpha that the loading makes with the horizontal, then you can write the horizontal component as P cos alpha and the vertical component as P sine alpha, right? So this differential equation becomes EI d square theta by ds square equals P sine theta minus alpha, right? Uh, so uh, the point is, this is almost indistinguishable from the equations for oscillations of a pendulum, right? You just call P by EI as minus G by L, replace theta by theta minus alpha and you get back the equation for oscillations of a pendulum. So the good thing about this is that a lot of stuff that people already knew about how to solve these equations for the oscillations of a pendulum, which was very important because people wanted to know how to keep track of time, right? And a pendulum appears in all kinds of applications uh, in, the, in the historical days, right? So a lot of people spend time and energy understanding features of these equations. So all of that automatically carries over to insights that we can get for the Elastica model. So there are lots of qualitative insights about uh, the Elastica that come directly from, uh, not from dynamical systems. And as you can imagine, there are even closed form solutions uh, available for, for this equation. Uh, usually these are in terms of elliptic integrals. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the main distinction between our system and this system here is that uh, the loading is different. Right here, you have an end load. You remember that in our system, we have loading with a pair of cables, right? So we have to worry about uh, that distinction, which is what I'll walk you through next. Okay, so the loading uh, from the two cables is denoted by F1 and F2, right? It's denoted by F1 and F2. Uh, these are a product of the magnitude, which is the tension, in the two cables, which is P1 and P2 times the direction. Right? This direction is simply the unit vector from the point of attachment on the beam to the rooting point. So for the first force, this will be R1 minus X1 divided by the magnitude. So that's what you see here. Right? So the uh, important thing to notice here is that uh, the, even though the attachment point itself doesn't move along the beam, the locations of X1 and X2, these attachment points, 
changes during deformation, right? So if you wanted to compute what's the location x1, you have to integrate the solution, right? So what this means is that the attachment points are functionals of the solution. So this is now a chicken and egg problem, right? If I know the loading, I can compute the solution theta, and so I know the attachment points. But to know the loading, I need the solution itself, right? So this is something that is very different from the loading that we saw on the previous slide for a very simple system. So the net takeaway here is that the direction in which the cable loads the structure is a solution dependent function. So that's one uh, aspect of cable loading, which is non-trivial. Cable loads are generally configuration dependent functions. But whatever the cable load may be, the, the beam still has to be at equilibrium, right? It still has to satisfy moment balance. So let's do that uh, for this cable system. So I'm going to create a virtual cut at this section AA, and I'm going to look at equilibrium of the section running from X all the way up to X2. So this means I have the internal moment EI bending modulus times curvature that should be equal to the external moment, which is from the load F2, right? The load acting along cable two. So this load will be uh, the moment, external moment will be R cross F, where R is X2 minus X, right? This is the moment arm times the force F2, which is the tension times the direction, right? That's what you see on the right-hand side, right? So just so that we have a complete grasp over uh, all these functionals and stuff, right? Uh, let's differentiate this once with respect to S so that we get a statement about force balance. So if you differentiate this equation with respect to S, theta prime will become theta double prime, no surprise there. Now, the position x2, the position of the tip, is given by integrating the tangent all along the length, right? You integrate from zero all the way up to the length, the tangent vector. Does this depend on s? No. It depends on the solution, it's a functional, but it does not depend on s, so its derivative vanishes. How about the position x, the place where we made the cut? It does depend on s because you have to stop the integral at the arc length s. So s appears in the uh, in the upper bound of the integral. So again, using Leibniz rule, if you differentiate this, you just get the tangent at this point. You get cos theta sine theta. And uh, finally, uh, the direction vector uh, r2 minus x2 divided by the magnitude is again a functional independent of s. So it's derivative branch. So formally performing this derivative, we get this balance equation, ei theta double prime plus uh, tangent cross the force vector equal to zero. So this is the equilibrium equation. This is slightly different from the previous equation that we saw, mainly because of the appearance of this direction dependent uh, uh, loading. So similarly, we can write equilibrium for a section BB. I'm not going to uh, work out, again, walk you through the details here, except that you see one, the effect of the first load also, because you've made a cut before, uh, because there are two loads acting, right? The first cable acts along the middle of the section. So now you have to worry about external moments from two loads. So you see that we have a piecewise statement for, for, for force balance, mainly because you have two loads. And you can write this in a more compact form using uh, the heavy side function. So if you put uh, the heavy side function, as you recall, is zero for negative numbers and is one for uh, all numbers greater than zero, right? So in this case, if you, if you make a cut uh, at S greater than S1, then this term becomes negative and so, so the first load will not exert a force. But basically this is the same equation that we saw on the previous slide, it's just written more compactly, okay? So we now have to augment this with a pair of boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are that the uh, one end is clamped, the end S equal to zero is clamped, and the far end is moment free. So that's what I've put in here. So this now defines our ODE. Now I'm a little bit worried about calling this an ordinary differential equation because these are functionals of theta, right? So these are complicated looking terms, but let's not worry about that. This is a differential equation in some form, okay? And this now defines our forward problem because if I tell you what is P1 and P2, you can pick your favorite integrator and uh, solve, right? You can solve for the solution theta. It looks very nonlinear and hairy, but don't worry about that, right? You can just use some numerical algorithm that will work. Uh, if you use a numeric, if you use an OD integrator, you have to couple it with the shooting method because uh, this is a boundary value problem. But uh, just uh, let's just assume that given these differential equations, 
uh, and the loads and the tensions P1, P2, you can now solve this differential equation. Okay. Now what I do is I use a finite element method in our uh, group's research code. So if you've taken a class on finite elements, this ODE defines your strong form. You multiply it by some admissible test function, you get the weak form, which is a statement of virtual work. Then you introduce some finite element spaces, function spaces, you get a discrete set of nonlinear equations. So if you're not familiar with finite elements, it doesn't matter. Just assume that there is some way to solve this differential equation. If you are familiar with finite elements, just keep a note that solving this discrete set of nonlinear equations requires some linearization because you'll have to solve it, for example, with the newton raphson method. And consistently linearizing these, uh, this weak form takes a little bit of attention because of these functionals. Okay, but there is no magic in this, right? So as long as you keep track of terms in a careful manner and you know what you're doing, there is no surprise uh, in that sense. Okay, so uh, I'm almost uh, towards the end of explaining how this, how this problem works, right? So uh, well, thank you for being patient so far, right? So our, our problem in this video is not the forward problem, right? Again, we want to find what are the tensions uh, to impose so that the tip will go and trace a desired location, right? So uh, we still have to satisfy a couple of constraints. The first one, the arm should always be at equilibrium, right? So whatever you do, whatever tension you put, the arm has to, will be at equilibrium. The second constraint is that the tip should go to the position that we want it to reach, right? So, uh, this is an inverse problem in which the unknowns are two parameters, P1, P2, and these parameters have to be in such a manner that a differential equation has to be satisfied. And the solution of this differential equation has to be in such a way that some integral of its cosine and sine gives us the target position we want, right? So you see a little plus here, that is just to say that uh, the loads P1 and P2 have to be strictly positive. That is, there cannot be any compression. Okay, so, um, this is a very daunting problem okay honestly speaking i don't know how to solve this okay because uh, you have an equality constraint a nonlinear equality constraint a nonlinear state equation and all the freedom you have is a couple of scalar parameters that you can play with what is the chance that you can solve this system simultaneously right solve a differential equation as well as impose a strict constraint while the only freedom you have is a couple of scalar parameters right so even if you manage to solve it, right, how do you know the solution is unique, right? Uh, if you don't manage to solve it, is it because your algorithm didn't work or sincerely there is no solution at all? So uh, this is a very hard problem, right? Instead, we are, going to, we are going to consider the problem that we can actually solve, okay? So what this means is we will settle, right? And say that, let's just do the best that is possible, okay? It's not important that it's not necessary that the tip actually reach the target. Let it get as close as possible. So I'm going to replace this equality constraint that the tip should coincide with the target and say that please minimize the distance between the tip and the target. Okay. If during the minimization process, you actually find that this distance is zero, then we have actually satisfied the constraint also. Right. So whenever J becomes zero, the, the optim optimization problem and the inverse problem become equal. Okay, so the reason to introduce an optimization problem is that we have lots of uh, tools that we can use, right? So this is an optimization problem in two parameters, P1 and P2, right? How hard can it be? And the other thing is, this is an optimization problem which is nonlinear and the underlying state equation is nonlinear, right? But nevertheless, the condition, I mean, there are standard ways to solve. Right? So if you want to minimize something, what do you do? You set the first derivatives to zero because that's a necessary condition. So when you differentiate J with respect to P1 and P2, you can imagine that the first derivatives of X uh, of the position of the tip with respect to P1 and P2 will show up. Because X depends on theta, the derivatives of the solution of this differential equation with respect to P1 and P2 will show up. And there are ways to compute all of these. Okay? You may recognize these to be the sensitivity of the tip with respect to the loads and of the solution with respect to the loads. Okay, I'm not going to explain how these are computed because these are more of detail, right? But you can trust me that these, uh, there are ways to compute this and it's within about a five minute explanation. So if you are interested, ask me after the talk or offline and we can chat about it. Okay, 
So we can now revisit uh, this video of uh, that we started off with, which was our motivating problem. So now you know what's happening in the background, right? I give a sequence of target positions and internally we will pose an optimization problem in which we, we want to compute the tensions that we want to impose in these two cables. And this optimization problem will try to get the tip as close to our target positions as possible. So in this way, for a given sequence of target positions, we will have a corresponding sequence of tensions, which is imposed by uh, reeling on these, by uh, controlling these cables using the pair of motors over here. Okay, so I want to draw your attention to a couple of things in this video. One is that this video has been sped up by quite a bit. Why is that? Because our algorithm assumes that the beam is always at static equilibrium. The arm is always at static equilibrium. So that means that we have to impose the loading in a very slow manner. The tensions have to be changed in a very slow manner. The second thing is that uh, this control is purely predictive, right? You don't see any sensors. There is no mechanism for feedback, right? A mechanics algorithm basically tells us how much tension to exert on these two cables so that uh, the tip will go and trace the curve that we want. Okay, so we can then look at accuracy uh, and over a number of experiments, you can, I mean, we looked at a number of experiments and we typically find that uh, positions are accurate within about one or two mm and angles within about one or two degrees. And uh, is one is one mm accuracy good, right? Uh, it's a subjective question. It depends on what the application you're looking at. But I think this one mm should be normalized by what's the length of the arm itself, right? So the length of the arm in this case is about 600 mm. So is one over 600 small or large? I mean, for the purpose of tracing a curve, I think that's good enough. <laughs> if, if you're going to poke a needle, I think one, one mm accuracy is not good enough, right? So it depends on uh, what's the application uh, you're looking at. Uh, the, uh, I, I'll close out this discussion with, uh, with, a, few, uh, with a few points, right? Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is that I said I impose the cable tensions on the on the using the motors, right? Uh, you don't see any load cells or tension gauges here. Why is that? Because we are actually computing loads, but uh, imposing the corresponding cable lengths. Okay, this just makes the experimental setup much simpler, right? So there are no load cells, there is no sensing, there is no feedback. Everything is purely predictive. Just makes it uh, the system more robust. Now, this idea of having load controlled uh, simulations, but length controlled experiments is actually very risky because uh, in any nonlinear system such as this one, there is always a possibility of multiple solutions that you always have to worry about whether there are instabilities. In both scenarios, load controlled and length controlled settings, you can have multiple solutions, you can have instabilities. It's just that the, the solution multiplicity and the stability in the load control setting is very different from that in the length control setting. So you just have to be aware of it and worry about it once in a while, okay? Uh, as soon as you call something a robot, right? We have to quantify what is the workspace. So the workspace here is the set of all points that the tip of the arm can reach, okay? Uh, one very simple way of determining the workspace is that the tensions of the cables have to be strictly positive, right? You can only have tensions and no compression. So that, that automatically sets some bounds on what are the set of points the tip can reach. For example, the red dots here on the screen are points uh, where at least one of the, the cables is, uh, is not in tension, right? So these are not points in the workspace. The green points are points where both cables are in tension. The workspace is actually much larger, but we didn't bother sampling elsewhere. Okay, uh, what should we compare this workspace to? You could say, okay, I can come. I have one link. I can compare this to a uh, to a link to a robot, which is a link uh, on a revolute joint. But that would probably not be fair because we have two actuator actuations, right? Two cables that we are controlling. So you could say I can compare this with uh, a two-link uh, mechanism. In which case there are some broad similarities between the workspace you see here versus the workspace you see here. So even with the two link mechanism, there are the workspace is um, is not the is not the entire disk because there are limitations on joint angles. In the same way, over here too, we have limitations on the workspace because you want to be able to use this arm over many many trials again and again, right? You want to make sure that the material does not leak and the arm does not break. 
Right? So you want to restrict the strings to be somewhat small. So that restricts your workspace in some way. You, like I said, you have to worry about whether there are any instabilities, right? So you can examine these kinds of instabilities by looking at uh, eigenvalues uh, of the system. And so you want to avoid regions where uh, you can have instability. So your workspace has to exclude uh, these regions. You may also, let's say, have to worry about uh, the energy that is available. Let's say a battery is running your, uh, your, your motors, right? then the power that is available from the battery may be limited. As a result, the energy required for operation would be limited. That may again restrict your workspace. And you have a couple of motors pulling on the cable, right? Each of these will come with some torque rating. So uh, this again will limit what are the set of accessible points, right? So uh, quantifying the workspace uh, depends on a number of factors. And if you have a very specific application in mind, I think this is something that uh, can be done. The other point I wanted to say was, okay, uh, there are, uh, it's not that flexible robots are not commonly used. I mean, are not commonly studied, right? In robotics, people study flexible robots quite frequently. So the, the a very common assumption that is used uh, in these kind of approaches is what's called the constant curvature assumption. Essentially in this picture, right? What this assumption will do is it will say that the section running from the base all the way up to this point is going to bend into an arc of a circle. And then the second section starting from this point all the way up to the end is going to deform into another arc of a circle. And this assumption is really helpful because you can forget about all the mechanics and inverse problems and all that. You just have to compute the centers of two circles and the radii of two circles. So this becomes a problem in algebra. So we can now examine whether this is a good assumption or not. So I took the case of tracing some geometric shapes and I looked at the curvature as a function of arc length. Let's, let's zoom in some more, right? You see a profile, uh, a plot uh, of the curvature of the arm along the arc length, okay? You see that the moment vanishes at the far end because the curvature there is zero. At the point where you have the first cable attached in the middle, you see that the the curvature has, is continuous, but has a small kink there because there is a discontinuity in force. So there is nothing wrong with this picture, okay? So if the constant curvature assumption were to be valid, right? Then what we should be seeing is that all of these profiles have to be constant over this section and possibly a different constant over this section. I would argue that that is very far from the case. So. This tells me that even if I try to use one of the existing uh, techniques that's commonly uh, used in robotics, I would probably not have gotten very good control. Okay. And uh, maybe uh, the other point I want to make is, can you actually control this by hand, right? <laughs> and uh, so Spurnakant was a student who worked on this and he worked on this for a very long time, right? Uh, almost a couple of years. And he tried to do this by hand, you know, really sincerely. And it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Uh, and we can kind of make sense of it now because uh, you can, we can look at what's the relation between uh, how the tip of the arm moves versus how much the load uh, you impose. And it seems to be a very nonlinear quantity, right? So it's difficult for, our, for us to grasp that, uh, that nonlinearity uh, by trial and error. But uh, a more intuitive way to understand it is that if you look at the at how sensitive the tip is to the tensions in the two cables, right? You see a large degree of nonlinearity. Don't worry about the picture on your screen. I'll just tell you that uh, how much the, let's say that you're pulling on cable two, okay? You increase the tension by, by a little bit. In some regions, the tip will move a lot. In some regions, it's move, it'll move by very little. So the tip is highly sensitive in some regions and very insensitive in other regions. In some regions, if you pull on the cable, the tip will turn to the left. In some regions, it will turn to the right. So not only is the magnitude of tip deflection very sensitive, the direction itself is very sensitive, right? So these are all things that we can quantify now. So it makes sense that uh, it's very difficult to control something like this by hand or by trial and error. And uh, the other thing is, it's not that tip control is the end of the story, right? we can actually extend almost the same framework to be able to control not just the tip position, but the entire shape 
of a flexible arm if you want it. So if you are thinking about something uh, that can crawl around and adapt to its surroundings or whatever, right? Uh, there is something on the horizon, right? That we can try. And uh, one last slide before I close out this problem is basically my perspective of what, <laughs> what this problem means, right? Uh, you could say, okay, Ram, I think now uh, you managed to trace something with a pen. That's good, but I can easily buy uh, a writing robot on Amazon for a few thousand rupees, or I can buy a few lead screws and motors and assemble them together to do a DIY project. And I can make something that's as good as yours or even better than yours. And I would completely agree with you. Okay, so I think the application to tracing something, right, uh, is not the significant aspect here, right? I think the significant aspect uh, you can see that I'm trying to motivate myself at this point about what the applications could be. Right? The, the significance here is that uh, the operating principle is very different. The stage at the top works only because there is no flexible element. The stage at the bottom, the robot at the bottom works only because you have a very flexible element. Right? So what's the significance of this? Right? Uh, if you think about how you can modify the arrangement at the top to make uh, something that can go into your body, let's say for a, for a medical application or something that can go into outer space for over a very large length scale, it would be very challenging. Both extremes are very challenging. Uh, at the, it is going to be challenging with the robot at the bottom also, but I think the challenges are kind of different and hopefully manageable, right? Uh, as long as there is no uh, new physics that becomes important, a beam will bend the same predictable way, whether it's one millimeter or whether it's one meter, right? So there is some hope that you could try to adapt uh, something like this to devices at a small scale as well as at a large scale. So there is some hope of miniaturizing or magnifying. Uh, it is also possible that devices that are flexible are easier to deploy because you can fold them up into a very small footprint and then deploy them to a much larger scale. Because of cable actuation, uh, you can keep the motors away from, uh, from, uh, from the working area. And the other thing to, uh, to point out is that the device below is far more energy efficient than the device above. Why is that? All the energy that you're putting in through these motors actually goes into bending the arm. That's a purely elastic element, right? So in principle, all that energy can be extracted back. I mean, it's just that that is probably a big research problem by itself. But I'm saying in principle, right, if you wanted to recover all the energy that you spent, you could recover almost all of it in the bottom picture, but not in the top, right? In the, at the top, all the energy has gone into moving rigid bodies. So there is no way you can extract it back, okay? So I'm going to stop with the first problem here. Uh, I think I've hit the 45 minute mark. I don't know, Ajay, you can tell me. We can either stop here or- I, uh, I think it, uh, we, we can finish, I think it, that should be great. I will need about 10 minutes. I, how, is, how what do the audience think? Uh, do yeah, you think? Just, there are some questions where we can see if there's- Sure, sure. Uh, I, I can pause now for questions. If you want to take a break, go get a cup of coffee. That's also fine. Are there any questions from anybody from uh, yeah, so, Can Hello. I ask you one thing? Yeah, yeah, but again, you have to tell me your name because I can't see the screen. Uh. Yeah, uh, I am Ramesh Gupta. I am alumni of IAC and currently in Shivnagar University as associate professor in mechanical engineering department. And uh, I am, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I just, uh, it is not a question actually, I want to, curious to know, uh, if let's say if we replace uh, this kind of a strip uh, with a tube kind of one, Hmm. Can we expect uh, the similar kind of uh, uh, mechanism in this fashion? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. So uh, if it's a question that points at open sections versus closed sections, is that the spirit? Yeah. Okay. I have not tried, so I'm not sure. With closed sections, um, everything depends on the aspect ratio, right? If you make the structure long enough, I think similar, you will probably see similar uh, behavior. If you make it short enough, the distinction between having an open section and a closed section will start to, to show up. Uh, you may have uh, localized deformation at some point. 
That's my guess. That's my guess. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm very glad that uh, you're here. I'm very glad that someone from IAC is here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, I have a some suggestions about it. So can I just start? Sure. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? I can barely hear you. Yeah. So uh, I'm here again. So I have a bit of a suggestion about this problem. Can I just pose it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of uh, just working on gradient descent based optimization huh. uh, in this uh, problem, can we just uh, try to linearize this problem by Koopman approximation? That yeah, you can do things which people do in controls too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am only vaguely familiar with uh, Koopman theory, but uh, I, I am 100% sure that uh, many kinds of controls will work here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, I'm Aditya. I attend your uh, nonlinear uh, slender structures. Oh, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Okay, sir, actually, uh, I was thinking about what material you've used for the bar and how are you... So, for the pattern, uh, are you scanning it before? How, how do you practical aspects of this? Uh, uh, for what pattern? I'm not sure. Sir, the last pattern that you have showed, uh, uh -huh. the one in the video right oh, now. Okay, so what I uh, so the material for the arm is that also your question or? Yeah, yeah yes, sir, both, both. It's just acrylic. Uh, basically, okay. anything, any material will work as long as again uh, you have a sufficiently slender structure. So if you're if you're thinking about using a steel, well, it has to be longer, right? Because uh, uh, because the stiffness is going to be higher. Okay, but uh, the material of the arm is almost insignificant as long as you have room to play with the aspect ratio. If you think of using a steel, I think spring steel may be better than uh, something that is uh, stiffer. For the, does that answer your question? The first part? Yeah, yeah. yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So the material is not not important at all. That is, in fact, one of the main reasons why flexibility could help. Because if you typically look at industrial robots, right, they are made of uh, heavy metal, heavy metals, right? Some steel, aluminium, something. Right? The reason they use metals and not, let's say, plastic, which would make it lighter, is because they have to rigidize the structure, right? Otherwise, the control doesn't work, right? So, in this case, because you allow for compliance, and you have to allow for compliance, as long as the strains remain small, right? That is no, that is not going to be much of an issue. So, the material choice, plastic, we just managed to buy sheets from Espiro, right? That's all. Uh, you could use metal also. Cutting them is a little bit more difficult in the lamp, right? That's why we stuck with plastic. Uh, the second part about uh, what are the patterns appearing, right? We just take an image, scan it, uh, and then uh, get some sample points from there, and those will be the target positions. That's all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So we just take a picture of the web. Uh, do some edge detection in the picture, and then you sample a few points along that picture. Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, am I uh, audible? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Very, this is Sashank. Uh, so I had one question. Uh, this is regarding the assumption that you made earlier, right? In the moment balance equation, that e i d theta over d x. So that is. Uh, we can do only when right the deflection is a small right as for the user can I scroll back to that slide let me see if I can if I can scroll back to the point where you are I might be wrong but I just no no problem, clarification. problem. Uh, is it is it somewhere uh, here uh, it can you go space? to the very first slide where you made that moment when I oh okay 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 uh, sorry I will I will get there yeah. Uh, yeah. Just be here. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So, so this what I here? EI, uh. So E I D theta over D S, right? So uh. this, as far as I can remember, this is for only when the deflections are small, right? But no, here, no, 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 as no, we no, can no, see, no, no, no. no. So uh, E I is the bending modulus, right? You can think. So yes. uh, E I basically, assuming. So is your. Let me understand. So your question is. Well, EI depends on S or not. Is that the case? 
no no uh, not that okay. uh, i'm just okay. yeah like we uh, make, make that make that assumption right in the euler bernoulli beam theory eid square oh, by okay, 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 okay. right, 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 right. so, okay. so the yes. main difference between what you see here and what you see in the euler bernoulli beam theory is that here curvature is d theta by ds okay this is okay. correct there is no approximation here in oh. euler bernoulli beam theory the curvature is d square w by dx square where w is the transverse deflection okay that is approximate because you are assuming that w prime the derivative of the deflection is small compared to 1 okay okay all the so, uh, making this Thank derivative you. there is no approximation i think the comparison between the uh, moment being uh, a bending modulus times curvature is uh, is accurate here is approximated in the linear theory there is no assumption about small deflections in this in this case okay all right thanks thanks for the clarification sure yeah okay uh, i i'll make sure that i don't keep you from lunch so i'll take 10 minutes on this i'm sorry i wanted to uh, finish up in under an hour so okay so this part is going to be in much less detail i think we've seen enough equations for a saturday so i'm going to tell you a little bit about elastic ribbons so elastic ribbons can do a lot of funky stuff as you see on your screen here right so uh, there are uh, intended applications uh, we are very far away from it but uh, the on the horizon i think are applications related to flexible electronics because people want to make electronics that can sit on your skin or on structures which are very small and deformable and stuff like that but and there are also applications in biomechanics there are groups which use ribbon models to study dna and things like that but my agenda here is much simpler right i'm just going to show you a few examples right to to, to convey the fact that uh, there is more perhaps in structural mechanics than just rods and plates right there could be a space there for ribbons also because their mechanics seems to be very rich and interesting so i'll show you a few examples to convey the fact that even though a ribbon looks long and narrow like a one dimensional structure the width is still a significant parameter right and i'll show you a few experiments combination of thought experiments real experiments and model predictions to say that uh, to convey some interesting aspects in in the mechanics of these structures okay so i should of course begin by telling you what i mean by a ribbon right so i hope you will agree with me that the structure on the left is a plate and the structure on the right is a is a rod right like a tube so roughly speaking ribbons sit on the bridge between these two right to make this idea more clear i'll mark some dimensions here so i mark the length width and the thickness for a plate a rod and a ribbon so for a plate the length and the width are comparable right and the thickness is much smaller for a rod the length uh, the width and the thickness are comparable and they are both much smaller than the length so in a ribbon uh, all three dimensions are distinct okay the length is typically much larger than the width and the width is much larger than the thickness itself so if you think of it there is one aspect ratio that typically dictates the mechanics of plates and rods which is the aspect ratio that is which is the ratio of the length over the thickness right in the in this case uh, the width is comparable to the length so w by h doesn't play a role independent role in this case again w by h is order 1 so it doesn't play a role on the other hand for a ribbon length over width is uh, one aspect ratio and width over thickness is a second aspect ratio right so in principle if the mechanics of plates and rods dictated by one aspect ratio is interesting you could say that a ribbon could be doubly interesting right because it has two aspect ratio but uh, the other point is that um, you could uh, you could say okay i know it looks different from a plate and a rod but i can still think of this as a as a plate with a very narrow width or as a rod um, with i mean as a plate with a narrow width or as a rod in which and the width is much larger than the thickness right you could think of this as a rod with a very slender cross section 
So both of those are, are typically done in the literature also. You'll find studies where people model ribbons as plates. You'll also find studies where people model ribbons as rods. And uh, they're applicable in some cases and other cases maybe not. The other reason that people have been studying ribbons more recently is that uh, there are now lots of tools available in math and applied math for dimensional reduction, including asymptotic analysis and convergence and gamma convergence, all kinds of stuff, right? Where you can systematically reduce dimensions from 3D to 2D, get 1D models starting from 3D or 1D and so on. So you can think of uh, systematic procedures of going from three dimensional equations to one dimensional equations. So ribbons in some sense have become case studies for applications of these techniques. Okay, let's get to my first agenda point. Is the width of a ribbon an important parameter or not? Okay, so for this, I'm going to show you a demonstration in which I am going to show a couple of structures. The length of these are not important. On the left, you see a, uh, a very narrow tube. This has a circular cross section. Okay, and uh, this is a case where the width and the thickness are very small, both equal the diameter. Right. On the right, I'm going to show you a ribbon, what I think is a ribbon, in which uh, the cross section is very slender. It has a narrow rectangular cross section. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the end so that they coincide. I'm going to bring them together. And you see that this uh, narrow cube basically deforms approximately in the same plane. It bends into an arc of a circle. And when the torque is large enough, it will close up into a circle. This is what we expect. If you do the same thing for a ribbon on the right, you see that it immediately deforms out of plane, right? Uh, it eventually forms a cylinder, but whose axis is perpendicular to the axis of this structure, right? This forms a cylinder uh, in which the axis is out of the plane of your screen, while the rod forms a cylinder in which the axis is in the plane of the screen, right? So this tells me that I cannot simply club the width of a ribbon into some into some parameter uh, uh, for uh, of a rod. Okay, so I think I need to worry about the width a little bit. The other extreme is when uh, I can compare a very uh, somewhat wide strip, which I will think of as a plate, and a narrow strip, which I'll think of as a ribbon. So here I'm going to do a similar experiment where I bend it so that it rolls up into a cylinder. Then I'm going to introduce a small offset and impose some tension. Right? As you see, this structure will fold over. Right? There is nothing else it can do. Right? It has to fold over. But when the width is somewhat smaller, you'll see that uh, there is some freedom for this uh, ribbon to pop out of plane and assume a much more convenient structure, right? something that looks like a helicoid. Right? So this effect is possible only because the width is sufficiently small. Right? So this demonstration again tells me that, OK, I cannot simply club ribbons with plates because the effect of the width uh, is significant and worth investigating. Perhaps an even more relatable example is what I would call the pizza slice effect. Right? You take a wide ribbon, you add a little weight at the end, and you put a little nut at the end. So because of this nut and its own weight, the ribbon will sag right? if I just fold it. But if I take advantage of uh, introducing some deformation along the width, which is a non-dominant dimension, right? The width is still smaller than the length. So if I control the curvature along the width, you see that I can now support the weight of not only the structure itself, but also some end mass. So we've seen this effect commonly in tape springs, right? It's the same effect. Or if, if you think about how to hold a slice of pizza, right? If you don't want to make a mess, you have to put in a little bit of curvature along the crust, right? So this gives some rigidity to the slice, um, which is not coming from the material. The material is still dough and it's very soft, right? It cannot take any load. But because of this geometrical stiffness, you can hold the slice together. So at this point, I hope that uh, you, you agree with me that the width of a ribbon is an important parameter. Let's do some thought experiments, okay? Uh, I have, uh, uh, thank you, Shashank, I saw the thumbs up. <laughs> So I'm going to do three thought experiments, all using uh, what is an annular ribbon. So I cut an annulus, I make a slit at the end. And on the left, uh, I call this experiment a transversely displaced annulus because I'm separating the ends away from each other in the transverse direction. The second experiment, I'm going to take half of the sample. I'm going to hold the sample along the diametrical end, and I'm going to bring them together. 
right? So then the ribbon will buckle out of plane and it forms this, uh, this uh, buckle uh, that looks like a little omega. The third experiment, I'm going to unfurl the ribbon. I'm going to rotate the ends by 180 degrees and stretch them out. And you see that a number of uh, interesting things happen. But all of these are experiments done with, in our head, with the same sample, right? Just very simple boundary conditions. Okay, let me ask, okay, why do you want to do these three tests, right? So I'll come to it in a minute. Uh, so this slide is a little bit busy. I'm going to walk you through this uh, in very small bits. I'm going to compare the predictions of four different models for these thought experiments. The first model is a linear plate theory. This is what we learn in our textbooks, okay? The which uh, linear theory is not particularly important because these are all bending dominated examples. So the distinctions are not significant. A second theory is a nonlinear rod theory. It's one of the most commonly used theories for modeling ribbons, right? This is a generalization of the Elastica model that we saw before. Uh, so this is a 3D version of it in some sense. You allow for bending about two axes and twist about a third axis. The third theory is a nonlinear plate model. It's again a very uh, uh, classical model. If you remember something about this theory, it basically has a coupling between membrane and bending terms, which is not there in the linear theory. So it's a very popular theory, especially because it's amenable for asymptotic analysis. But again, it's a very commonly used theory for ribbon structure. And the fourth one is a very general uh, plate theory. It allows for finite deflections, rotations, whatever you want. Okay, so I'm going to compare the predictions of four theories, none of which are mine, right? All of these are classical theories. Let's see what happens. So I'll walk you through stages. Okay, the first is the transversely displaced annulus. I am comparing the prediction of the linear plate theory with the nonlinear rod. One is shown in yellow, one is shown in blue. They don't agree. Next, I will compare the pinched semi annulus. I am comparing the rod model with the nonlinear plate. One is in blue, one is in magenta, and they don't agree. The third is the unfurled annulus in which I'm comparing the nonlinear rod with the nonlinear plate. One is in blue, one is in orange, and they don't agree, right? So we have three thought experiments, uh, four classical models, right? I haven't actually told you how I'm computing these predictions, but you can trust me that these are reasonably well documented in the literature. You may not already have it in your code or in the software that you use, but uh, these are all relatively well understood uh, ways of computing. So I use some research code in my group, but it doesn't really matter how you compute these. You can just trust me that uh, it's reasonably well understood. Okay, so we have three thought experiments, four classical models, and none of them, no two of them seem to agree, right? So this is the point where I am more nervous than the student, right? Maybe there is a bug in the code. Maybe there is something that we are doing that's stupid. We don't really know, right? So, um, we did, we spent almost six to six months to a year trying to cross check all of these simulations using whatever software you can get our hands on. And it didn't seem like there was anything wrong uh, with these predictions themselves. It's just that they didn't really agree with any one of them. So that's the rationale behind these three thought experiments. You can trust me that there is some thought behind the choice of these experiments. These are designed in such a way so that it teases out some assumptions that are being made in these theories, okay? So that's what this is supposed to show up. If, I mean, and you can say, okay, maybe this is a very peculiar scenario with annular ribbons, and that's still not the case. All of us know and have seen or have made a Mobius strip, right? You take a rectangular strip, you bend it into a cylinder, you twist one of the ends and you glue it together. You get a Mobius strip. And there are many models of Mobius strips. Uh, there are qualitative models which try to get the topology correct, right? So here is a, uh, a model that Darshan made in which uh, you have a structure which is topologically identical to a Mobius strip. It's composed exclusively of planes and cylinders. Okay, and this is based on some construction given in the 1930s. Okay, so uh, what we are interested in now is in asking what's the actual shape of a Mobius strip, right? What's the shape of a physical strip that you can make with paper or plastic? And this turns out to be a surprisingly difficult question. And I'm showing two uh, major developments in the pre-2000 era. One was in the early 1960s where Wanderlich is a German uh, mechanician. So he said, okay, we can model Mobius strips as developable surfaces. 
and he proposed an energy functional and uh, the prediction of that functional turned out to be very hard and it was solved only 10 years back and numerically okay the other major uh, co contribution in this area was in the early 90s when uh, people said that you could model a mobius strip as if it were a kirchhoff rod with a slender cross section just as we did before okay not showing you the comparison between the predictions of these two but you can trust me again that these are contradictory so when i say that uh, these models don't agree I'm not talking about distinctions that are 5 mm away 10 mm away i'm talking about qualitative disagreements for example if you look at the strain profile you will see in, uh, contradictions in the number of zero crossings you will see contradictions in the number of minima and maximum and stuff like that in the mobius strip for example you can look at the the places where the curvature and the torsion of the center line vanished these two theories predict contradictory data okay so we don't actually know <laughs> which one is correct or if either one is correct right so in this scenario you know we are in a rut and the only thing to do is to do some experiment so again i'm going to skip the details you uh, we made some sample we cut some annular ribbons made some fixtures to load them to mimic our thought experiments and we came up with some techniques to actually measure the three dimensional shapes of ribbons so this turns out to be quite a difficult problem because these are not small deflections right uh, you cannot simply mount a strain gauge and get useful data out of it because you have to worry about whether the strain gauge actually interferes with the measurement these are very compliant structures even if you manage to get a good strain measurement what is it going to help you do right a sparse measurement doesn't really help in this sense so we came up with some techniques if you're interested in knowing about these the master student who worked on some of these aspects has a thesis colloquium on wednesday you will find information about it on the any website on the front page or just send me an email i'll send you the the link to the meeting but we managed to measure three dimensional shapes and sample deformation mapping so what's the verdict uh, well okay i'm showing a couple of measurements sample measurements here uh, you can reconstruct three dimensional shapes and so on with some reasonable accuracy 200 microns is definitely not the best in the best possible but it's good enough for our for our purposes to make comparisons okay so the verdict is that uh, thankfully the most general plate theory seems to agree well with the experiment uh, not just the annulus case but also in the case of the mobius strip and this is almost expected right because we knew that uh, the, all the other rod models and the von karman plate theory all of these make some assumptions which can be um, which can be defeated in some sense so the point is that uh, I, all of these models that i showed you for these experiments all of these are classical models there is nothing wrong with them it's just that their application to studying ribbon structures uh, needs some some deliberation right so you could say that the other takeaway is that annular ribbons could be thought of as an, a model system right because we took a single sample of an annular ribbon and we loaded the same sample in different ways uh, to achieve a tunable degree of nonlinearity what is the meaning of tunable degree means that i can systematically make increasingly uh, nonlinear theory space right so you see that we can impose loading scenarios which makes the linear theory fail which makes the von karman theory fail which makes the nonlinear rod fail and eventually i'm sure there is a scenario in which the the plate theory can also fail so in that sense you could think of this as a, a model system that can be used to study ribbon the, of course it's not just about uh, finding out how to model these these structures are interesting to study in their own right uh, so i'm showing the unfurled annular uh, ribbon in this case where i'm comparing experiment with simulation you see that there are sudden and small perturbations which happen right and when i stretch out the ribbon far enough you will see that small facets and vertices start to appear and these are telltale signs of bifurcation uh, you the video here will show it in a more uh, in a more clear manner you can tell that there are bifurcations by for example monitoring the displacement of one of the points let's say the center point here or uh, you can also look at the mean curvature distribution along the ribbon itself i'm painting positive regions with red and negative regions with blue you see that there are abrupt changes in the number of blue and red regions this is an integer number right any time there is an abrupt change you can be rest assured that the system is undergoing a drastic change and that's typically a bifurcation 
right? So this is a very simple system in which you can get a series of bifurcations and you can get multi-stability. So the picture here shows experimental measurements uh, of uh, a ribbon with identical boundary conditions in which there are six stable equilibrium states. We stopped at six because the picture gets very messy, right? But there are many, many more. You can get energy focusing, you can get faceting, you can get all kinds of interesting features of this, which is a fun playground for us to do research. So I'll stop here. Uh, I'll stop here just by saying that uh, hopefully there was some useful information in this uh, in this talk, and I hope that you saw that uh, there is lots of uh, scope for in including geometry, mechanics, optimization, and a combination of modeling, simulation, and experiments, which makes the study of nonlinear structural mechanics very interesting. Right? I've missed out on one big topic here, which is dynamics. Right? Uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, is dynamics. Static is boring, right? So that's something that, uh, which is not addressed in this talk. It's something that we are uh, hoping to learn very soon, okay? So I'm sorry about going over an hour. I feel bad about it, but hopefully I didn't delay your lunch. Uh, so Ajay, I can stop here. I can stay for uh, as long as, as you want. Is there any questions? Then I think we can open the floor for questions. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. I, you can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions, then we can go floor for questions. I think it was like uh, super interesting. I have some, but I, I would let others uh, go ahead if there are any questions. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. Don't worry about being politically correct and all that. That's fine. <laughs> any questions? On the part. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, so my name is Umesh uh, from NIT Surat, Karnataka. Nice to meet you, Umesh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have one question. Like the arm that is moving, isn't it possible that the arm should will be moving vertically? Oh, okay. Uh, so because the, the sketch, whatever it's been drawn, so the starting, uh -huh. it's drawing a curve. Correct. Uh, it can't be avoided. Like, uh, let me let me hit play here. So, can you tell me again in the bottom picture? Your question is yes, why doesn't yes. the arm move in the third dimension? Yeah, yeah. Like oh, because like the pen that uh, is uh, touching the paper. Uh, like once the diagram has been done, like once it has uh, been finished. Uh, yeah. Isn't it possible that the arm will be moving like? Uh, so the video here is shot from a perspective. So the whole experiment is in a plane uh, on a table, right? So it, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe I should have said that. This is not, this uh, experiment is not happening in the vertical plane. It's being drawn on a table. Yes. So bo all the loading and the boundary conditions are in the same plane, right? So uh, because the strip is kind of wide, uh, you can be rest assured that the deformation is going to be completely planar. There could be a little bit of warping because of the self weight. Uh, if you are aware of lateral torsional buckling, right? If you, yes. you said you're a mechanical engineer, right? Yes, yes. So uh, maybe you've seen it. I'm sure civil engineers have seen, have heard about it, right? If you have a long beam, typically in uh, steel or concrete, right? You have a long structure because of the self weight. At some point, uh, a structure can warp out of plane. That will still happen here. Uh, I think there are enough constraints in place so that it's minimized to some extent. Okay, but uh, because the loading is in the same plane, right? All the forces are acting in the same plane. Uh, it manages to deform in this in a single plane. Okay, sir. thank Does you. Sir. Answer your question, Amesh. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thank okay. you. Sir. Any other questions? Yeah, so I yeah you said you had some. Huh. Go ahead. I had the same question. So uh, that would, uh, if, I mean, okay, that was a little uh, bit small there. So, so you, it's moving in a single plane, right? So if we are kind of, if we would try to generalize this into a 3D motion, then we probably need to rewrite our equations uh, 
and that makes it more the first thing to do uh, to extend this to, to 3d is to get a good phd student <laughs> right so yeah definitely it would be nice to do this in 3d i think uh, it's also a much harder problem like you are suggesting right yeah i mean it, it just takes someone <laughs> who's willing to stay past 5 pm <laughs> Right. Yeah, I agree. It could be a yeah, fun problem. Right. So what what is done there is like really fantastic. I mean, I was just thinking of like uh, uh like how how do we put it into three D, right? I mean, so when you're looking at right. those biomechanical uh, biomechanics application and biomedical application, right, right. then uh then essentially this would be have this would have to like trace in a three D uh, survey right. here, and then it could be really fantastic to. I think uh, the other challenge in three D is that gravity compensation will become important here. Uh, gravity compensation is almost taken care of because we do it in the horizontal plane, right? right. right. So yeah. we'll have to account for it, but I think that's not going to be a factor that will, that should, I mean, that's not a reason not to do it. I think that's just the reason which will make it slightly more difficult. Yeah. Uh, but also like, for example, let's say, uh, one thing that you said also caught me was like, you said that uh, uh, since the solutions are more quasi static, so mm. the speed of sketching has to be reasonably slow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So would, would it kind of like uh, considering the dynamics, would it stabilize this thing somehow? I mean, considering the inertia of it. So that's a good question. Actually, most of the robotics work on this kind of a problem is in the dynamic regime right. uh, because people want to control. Um, I mean, you have uh, ways to control the torque at the base so that the tip uh, vibrations are minimized, right? So that is definitely a much harder problem. We kind of sidestepped it uh, in this work. Uh, I'm, I think one possible way to uh, kind of minimize the effect of dynamics, right? Is to have additional constraints, right? You could have a, a few extra cables which will constrain the system much more. They are still moving in a consistent manner, right? Uh, just these two cables are actually doing the driving, but additional cables are basically uh, uh, minimizing the vibration, right? That's I would say the uh, cop out answer, but I I honestly don't know if I ran this at a higher speed, right? Surely the tip will vibrate much more, and, and the stepper motor has a has a quantized motion, right? A step by step motion. That itself may go and get transmitted. I'm not sure because the cables will load it in a kind of a jerky manner. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know if whether we should embrace it or avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Ramshir. This is Chandra Prakash from IIT Kanpur. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, uh, when you talked about the problems on ribbons, you ah. said you had uh, uh, tried uh, quite a few models, especially ah. starting from classical to Coseda and so on. Yeah. Uh, uh, although you have not shown the result here, uh, the question is this, uh, isn't Coseda more applicable to, uh, I mean, the choice of choosing a theory, is it also not dependent on uh, or more catered to whether the sample is polymeric or bio-based or Mm. Or foam like material, or I mean, or, because the, when we say ribbon, it is anyway elastic or, and mm. flexible. Uh, mm. So, did you see any significant differences between classical and Coursera? Uh, so, uh, I think uh, uh, the that uh, the my my using that Coursera theory is a little bit misleading, because uh, the theory is correct and we use the we use that theory right, but not for the reason it's meant for. So these are all bending dominated examples. So the effects of uh, the material become less significant because the coupling between stretch and shear and bending, all of that goes away. Most of this is purely in bending. So uh -huh. in bending dominated cases, right? Unless the material has a lot of microstructure that we need to worry about. Uh -huh. Effectively, the bending modulus factors out, right? So if you have a displacement controlled experiment, which is what we have, the findings are material independent, but like you said, if you had a foam, if you had a, let's say a polymer with some internal structure and all that, uh, I wouldn't know. I mean, some effects, some 
intricacies of the material model have to go in. Here, we simply assumed a linear relationship between stress resultants and the corresponding strain measures, right? Uh, uh, the proportionality constants are the typical constants we know, membrane modulus, shear modulus, and bending modulus. So, but in all these examples, right, I could have replaced Poserat plate with a Kirchhoff plate. Nothing would change because they're all bending dominated. Okay. Yeah. And, and the ribbon which you chose is some kind of a standard ribbon or you had to make it something <laughs> custom? These are all my grandfather's x-rays. Oh, great. <laughs> right. So I picked the x-ray mainly because you get it very easily and they, are, they don't come pre-rolled. Typically, uh, sheets come pre-rolled and it's difficult to iron out the residual uh, curvature. So yeah. x-ray sheets come in a very standard thickness and uh -huh. uh, they are polymers, plastic sheets. They are about uh -huh. 0.2... Uh, mm in thickness, which is good enough. They're not so soft that uh, is very difficult to handle. It's kind of the optimal thickness. We tried also with paper, with uh, bond paper and uh, A4 sheets. There, the issue is that uh, you can get little tears here and there because the fibers are all over the place, right? And we won't, we won't find it. Here, I think the structure is a little bit more reliable. So these are all very simple X-ray sheets. We've also done with polymer sheets. It doesn't make any difference. Thank you. Thanks, Ramchandra, yeah. for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ajay, I think uh, there aren't yeah. any questions, but feel free to get in touch with me, right? Uh, if you found anything that you wanted to discuss. So I think we can then close the lecture here. Thank, thank yeah. you for all the participants for joining in and for all the uh, nice interactive questions. Also, thanks to Ram for taking his time and uh, joining us and uh, a really fantastic lecture and uh, really entertaining and both. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you for staying up. What is it, 2 o'clock? Uh, 1.30. <laughs> 1.30, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day then. Bye.